Today's a special day for us. We've been interviewing Tim York uh, for a couple of months and getting to know he and his family. We've taken them through a whirlwind, meeting people and the staff and life group leaders this morning. But we are praying and in search for our associate minister position. It's been tremendous getting to know he and his family. His wife, Anita, is here, and their 15-year-old daughter, Charity, is here as well. And it's just been really great to get to know them. They have two other kids that are in ministry that are adults. You see their, the Tim's bio in your bulletin. So he's going to preach a great message for us this morning. We're going to have him come up on stage. Would you please welcome this morning Mr. Tim York to Poplar Springs. Good morning. It is very good to be with you today. I want you to know that at my core, I am a North Carolina boy, but I've been away from home for a long time. I've served in Tennessee, I've served in Indiana and Illinois, then almost Chicago, and now I've made my way back to Tennessee and hoping to return home. My dad, he still lives in Pofftown, so I am fairly local growing up. He's actually with us today, but also through him, I have my roots near here. We have family ties to the Capella area. So just a little bit, I feel at home today. As he said, my immediate family is also with me today. My wife, Anita, who in our family, she's our rock. My ball of energy daughter, Charity, is with us. If I was going to describe Anita to you quickly, she is a prayer warrior with a servant's heart. That's who she is, and she loves to serve. Charity is a lover of people, great at hugs, and she loves her music. And she asked me to just give a demonstration of who she is, and this is from her. When she gets excited, one of her favorite newest things to say, is she goes, slay. <laughs> and she likes to pop her hair out. But, so maybe if she gets comfortable with you this afternoon at Pop Fest, she will show you her slay. As was mentioned, also, I have two adult children. Faith is our oldest daughter. She is a missionary in Rome, Italy. And just about a week and a half ago, we got to go visit with her. For the last three years, we've got one, one week or 10 days or so with her, and it's been a blast. I have a son, Justice, who serves in ministry at Christ Church of the Valley in Phoenix, Arizona. I also have a connection to Popper Springs. It's an old one, but to me, it's very, very real. Through Park Springs and Poplar Springs years ago, I was introduced to your youth minister at the time. His name was Todd Brown. He had a major influence on my life. He was the inspiration for me going to Johnson University. And then since then, going to Johnson, I have now spent about 35 years in various forms of ministry. So I wanted to thank this church for sharing your resource of a minister, sending him to camp for years. For about six years, I got to go to camp with him. He inspired me. He was a creative. I'd never really seen a creative in ministry, and I have tried to take some of the, his creativity and apply it to every ministry I have been a part of. So thank you for that. I have chosen today to share a message about Jesus. Imagine that actually my favorite subject. This sermon is from a series that I wrote that evolved after reading through the book of John. I read through with students and adult leaders. And this is what came out of it. I have I've titled the series Jesus in His Own Words. So I think the fundamental question of life is who is Jesus? We can't get caught up in the fact we're, we're not answering the question, who was Jesus? It's who is Jesus right now in this moment? And we're going to come back hard at that. But sir, first, I want to kind of give a framework of laying out the message today. So I want to ask anybody probably who is 45 or older, you're going to remember sometimes, of how we used to travel we traveled eight hours to get to you. We have traveled all over the, the countryside since we've been here. And I'm glad we're not doing it the old way. 
paper maps. Those maps that when he unfolded them would almost cover your whole dash. Those maps that caused all kinds of arguments between whoever your co-pilot was and the person driving. Or if you were by yourself, the dangers of trying to look at the map and drive at the same time. I remember many of those years. I remember the transformation of how we trans transitioned over to the old first GPS units, those big boxes that everybody had to have, and we all went in and put them in our cars. And they were not even very good at the beginning because all the roads were not even mapped for the GPSs yet. I remember traveling in a 15-passenger church van with a bunch of kids, and over and over again, my machine was going rerouting, re and then all the kids would get into the same thing, and the whole van was going rerouting, and now, though, now we have these awesome GPS devices that we just carry in our pockets. I almost trust it 100%. Just a couple weeks ago, my family and I, my daughter, who is the missionary in Rome, she likes to teach us lessons about Rome. And she goes, you got to find your way yourself. And so she sends us off on our way. All we have are our GPS. It's in a different language. The streets are all titled differently, but my GPS worked perfectly. Took me down to the steps, to when to turn left in 50 meters. Okay, I think I know what a meter is. I'm going to turn left there. And it worked perfectly. Today, I want to give you a glimpse, maybe a fresh glimpse of who Jesus is. How am I going to stay on track? What's going to be my GPS? Are Jesus' own words? the best if I could share anything of value today why not let it be the possibility of a more clear image of who Jesus is because a clear picture of Jesus that's what shapes that's what reroutes anybody's future potentially their eternity we're going to be in the book of John historically we know John was a student he was a disciple of Jesus and the way he writes, he seemed to be a close friend of Jesus. And one thing that stands out in his gospel that's unique to the other three is he has these seven I am statements that Jesus, he records that Jesus says about himself. I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. Again, today we have time to focus on one of those. So we're going to turn, if you would, in your Bibles to John chapter 11. And we'll pick it up at verse 25. So Jesus said to her, we'll find out that this is Martha. She is the her. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he quickly follows that up with this. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. That is a powerful statement that Jesus makes about himself. We start to understand that believing in Jesus is how we connect to real life. And then there's that big part about never dying. As Charity would say, that's very interesting. And I want us to know that it still applies to us today. Now, hang with me one more time. So we got the GPS framework. Let me give you just one other little piece to make a background of framework, and that's the word fear. I think we all understand that in our world today that fear is everywhere. And all of us probably have our ideas of why fear is everywhere. I can think of two big ones. First in our world, with those same devices that have the GPS units, things spread so fast. Something could happen this morning around the world, something that makes them all very afraid, and within an instant, we have those same fears. Things spread really, really quickly. And secondly, this is how I see it, people today have learned 
and this is not a good thing, but they have learned how they think to use fear correct, correctly that they can make a lot of money off of fear. And usually the root cause of major fear concerns is death. Nothing scares like death scares. It's a terrible thing to think that those close to us or even us are going to die. So instead of thinking about those kind of things, what happens is a lot of us, we get gullible in those kind of moments. We're going to try almost anything to move away from death. First thing that popped into my head, so I'm not wanting to step on anybody's toes, I'm going to preface that ahead of time, was 10, 15, 20 years ago was the essential oil craze that went across our country and everybody jumped on board. Now, my family, we chose not to jump on board. I, I like to think of the wide road and the narrow road. I like to stay on the narrow road most of the time. But that doesn't make me better than anybody else because there's all kinds of other things that I have tried. All kinds of vitamins. All kinds of workout supplements. All kinds of purchased workout equipment. And we do essential oils. We do all the workout stuff, hopefully with the idea that I'm just going to get a little more a little more life out of using this because we all have a natural fear of death. Most of us, I think, we understand that one day is going to be our last day on the planet. We just don't want it to be today for us or anybody we know. And even though we all know that death is going to happen, I have found that nobody really likes to talk about it. Early in my first lead ministry position, I had a congregation of two services. In my first service, I will call them the more mature service. And I could tell that somewhere down the road, I was going to be doing a whole lot of funerals. And I wanted to be smart about that. I wanted to do the best funeral that I could do. So I said, what about if I could have the people help pre-plan their own funerals. And it had been done before, so there was all kinds of research out there. There's all kinds of good questions out there. And I'm thinking, this will be a great way to honor somebody's life, but also encourage their families at that future date because the person was involved in doing all the planning. So I built this giant questionnaire, had a lot of respectful questions built in, had a lot of selections they could make that would happen in their service. I'm thinking this is going to be so beneficial at this future sad day. This is going to be great. I think I passed out at least 75 of those questionnaires. I got back zero. None of them wanted to think about it. And honestly, they were all not too far from it. Most people just seem to be uncomfortable thinking about death. So if that could wash over you right now in this moment, that would be really good. Just for you to get that uncomfortable feeling about death. Because it's in a very uncomfortable death moment that Jesus speaks and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they're going to live. So we're going to go to the exact moment those words were spoke. And it's going to give us a really good feel for what Jesus, I think, wants us to understand. Something we could grab a hold of and take with us. In John chapter 11, Jesus says these words at what is basically a funeral. I say basically because the one who calls himself the life, the one who calls himself the resurrection, he's, he's in attendance. So it's supposed to be a funeral, but a surprising thing is going to happen. But let's back it up and see the gist of the story. John chapter 11, verse 1. So it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany. He's the village of Mary and her sister Martha. We grow to understand that Lazarus is their brother. 
We don't know what the sickness was, but we do know the sickness is bad enough that the sisters felt the need to involve Jesus. They're going to ask for his help. Verse 3 shows us how they did that. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. That's all that was recorded. They knew that Jesus would know that that meant Lazarus. And so now we start to understand that Jesus and Lazarus also have this real friendship. People on the scene there, they know that. And they have a faith that Jesus could do something. Now, realistically, this could be any of us today. My guess is all of us are crying out to Jesus for something. In the world that we live in, we're anxious. There's all kinds of anxiety. We pray against it. There's sickness around us. There's sickness in us. We, we pray against it. There's relationships, marriages, difficulties that come with that. There's relationships of friendships and the difficulty that come with that. There's people who are looking for a job, a ministry. <laughs> and there's things that we pray about that. And then once you reach a certain age, you start to have your own laundry list of bumps and bruises and pains that you have that become part of your prayer time. My list is growing daily. And then on top of those, those are the ones I call the super serious prayer request that I get and I move them straight to the top of my prayer list this is someone who gets the cancer diagnosis this is someone who potentially has the short life expectancy and you go in super prayer mode you pray hard now what do you say to that person though praying for someone and saying something to that person are two different things I have learned throughout the years there are good things to say. There's not so good things to say. Just recently, I heard somebody who was talking to somebody who was very ill. And this is, this is how they came at it. They would say something like, well, death. You know, death is natural. It's going to happen to all of us eventually. And I'm going, no, no, don't, don't say that. We already know that death is a scary thing. So don't make it worse now by acting like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. John chapter 11 is a great read. But for time's sake this morning, I'm going to need to start to summarize just a little. So what happens is, word gets to Jesus, how sick Lazarus is. Now, what does Jesus do? This is his friend. What is Jesus going to do? If you're reading through the first time, you go, oh, this is surprising. Jesus chooses to do nothing. He actually waits a couple of days even before starting his trip. And it seems weird, right? But when we get to the end of the story, even that, starts to make sense so I'm reading through and I go okay file that away there is always going to be an end to the story and somehow some way Jesus is always going to be involved but sometimes it's going to feel like that Jesus lets things play out before jumping into the story that's what it's going to feel like and if we're in those kind of moments that's when we start to feel like we don't have any hope anymore because it feels like Jesus is not actively involved. And even there's a lesson in that. God, at times, takes his time. Still doesn't mean he's not at work. He's always at work. So when it starts to feel like I can't feel what God is doing, this is when our belief in Christ has to kick in. This is when our trust has to kick in because when our belief and our trust kicks in, that's when hope kicks in. And we don't exist well unless we have hope in our lives. Eventually, Jesus gets to Bethany. He gets to Lazarus' house. And it's not good. John 11, verse 17. On his arrival, 
Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb, so he's dead. Has been for four days. The four is important. We don't get things in the Bible that's not important, but that number is important. So a little research, a little study on this. The Jews had a way of looking at death. That when you died, your spirit hung around your body for three days. If anything miraculous was ever going to happen, it's going to happen during the three days. But after the three days, it's done. It's all over. No hope left at all after three days. Jesus shows up on day four. Everybody there is thinking, there's nothing even Jesus can do now. Jesus, you're too late. Now, there's all kinds of people on site who believe in Jesus. But they're thinking now, only if you had showed up earlier, Jesus, you could have done something then. But somehow your timing's off. Jesus, you're too late. And I wonder how many of us have felt something like that. Even God can't do anything now. Why? Because it's, it's too late. It's gone too far. And this is when your wrestling match begins because you believe that Jesus could have done something. But then you think he didn't and it's too late. And you're wrestling with all that, how it happens. Let's look at Martha in verse 21. This is how she's feeling. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary shows up later and she says the same thing in verse 32. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Can you feel the tension? They believe in Jesus. They do. But now they're upset. They feel like he didn't show up in time. And then the crowd that's gathered around, they jump in too in verse 37. Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? See, the crowd, most of the crowd also has a belief in Jesus, but it, the belief doesn't go this far. Why? Because it's been four days. If only he'd gotten here earlier. And how many times have we thought of something similar? Jesus, I know you could have done something, but I just wish you showed up earlier. Now, it's too late. That dream I had that I hoped was going to come true is gone. My marriage, my relationship, Jesus, you could have done something. Now, it's too far. My, my friendship, God, I really wanted you to work. I knew you could have done, you could have saved that friendship. But now, it's too late. If we have ever felt anything similar, I want us to focus in on verse 23. Jesus said to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha's caught off guard. I think she responds a lot like we would respond in that moment, especially at the moment of a loss, at the moment of a death. I've seen this over and over play out at funeral homes over the years. People going through the line, meeting and greeting and trying to encourage. And they'll say words like this, you know, you'll see them again in heaven. Or you're dealing with somebody who themselves is in a lot of pain and somebody may say, you know, that one day in heaven, there's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more tears. You see, I've started to recognize something. I see it in myself at times. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus of the past. That Jesus was amazing walking on the water, taking some mud, adding some saliva and rubbing it on a blind man's eyes and he goes, washes it off and he can see Jesus did incredible things in the past. 
then we also can believe in the God of the Jesus or the future. Future Jesus is going to do incredible things. Coming riding in on the white horse, sword in his mouth, taking his people, the one he loves, the one who have chosen him. So we believe in Jesus of the past. We believe in Jesus of the future. But there's a lot of people that struggle with the Jesus of the right now. I think this is where Martha's at. She's not, she doesn't seem to be comforted by the thought that someday in the future, our brother's going to rise. Look at how she answers in verse 24. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. What, what's she saying? We have to read between the lines a little bit. I believe in you, Jesus. I know if you'd have showed up earlier, you could have helped Lazarus. But now I also recognize that at the end, Lazarus is going to live again. We all will. She's basically saying, Jesus, you're too late. So now, now I got to wait until the end. So here's what I think, here's what I hope we can get out of this piece of history. Jesus is the God of the past. Yes, he could have chose some miracle. He could have got there in time. He could have healed and did something with Lazarus. And yes, at the very end of all time, he's still going to be in control. But I want us to wonder about the now, today. Can we still have hope today? And I'm saying, oh yeah. Hope is what drives the world forward. And Jesus, in our hope, makes us super strong. Our faith is not just historical. Our faith isn't just for the future. Our Jesus is big enough to give us hope and life right now, today. I want you to listen to how Jesus responds to everyone there. Everyone there had that day four attitude in Bethany. This is when Jesus is going to unleash, I think, one of his most powerful I am statements. And basically, this is the preface. This is, this is how I interpret it before I say it from Scripture. Martha, I'm so glad that you believe in that future resurrection. But you do know that's going to happen because of me, right? That's kind of what Jesus is saying. And it comes to verse 25. She's worried about her brother. It's all done. It's over. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And then Jesus is going to turn that right to her with this big giant question. And I think we're being asked the same question this morning. Verse 26, do you believe this? Martha, I'm more than the God of yesterday. I'm more than the God of the future. Martha, I'm the God of right now. Martha, I can resurrect this moment. Do you believe? And she says, yes, yes, I believe you are the Messiah. And then it's like to prove her belief is correct, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead even after all of their impossible day four attitude. Jesus goes to the tomb. He says, roll the stone away. Now watch Martha here though. She begs him not to. Oh, Jesus, you sure about that? And so we start to see that her belief still has some limits. She doesn't have a perfect faith, but it is a faith. And I find such solace in that. I don't have to have a perfect faith. I've just got to put some trust in Jesus, and he's going to do some things. Jesus, if you open that stone, it's going to smell like death in there. It's going to be horrible for all of us. Jesus, it's been four days. And in my head, I picture Jesus going up to Martha and going, Shh, Martha, I got this. And then I start to think about us. Is there anything in our life that might smell like death? Something we feel that is too far gone. Even Jesus can't revive that. A dream, 
a relationship, you finding purpose in life. It's not going to happen. It's too far. I'm telling you, it's not too far. Watch what Jesus does. This is the God we serve. 1125, I am the resurrection and the life right now in this moment. And then jump to verse 40 through. He starts to talk to the grave. Lazarus, come out of the grave. And even after four days, Lazarus comes stumbling out, wrapped up in his grave clothes. And Jesus says, unwrap the man. He's alive. Jesus is not just a past thing. Jesus is not just for the future. Jesus is for the now. How? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus specializes in bringing things to life. So what Jesus is saying, that he is the resurrection and the life, that means wherever he is, wherever Jesus is, dead things come back to life. Do you believe that? And remember, Martha, faith, her faith wasn't perfect, but it was real. This kind of faith is what puts hope in your heart. I trust, I believe in Jesus. I want you to recognize this morning that Jesus brings things to life. Another question. If Jesus can step into a room and he can bring th dead things back to life, where is Jesus currently? Somebody's going, oh, Jesus is right here. He's in this room. It's a beautiful room. He's in this building. He's in this structure. No, not quite. Oh, he's here. He's here in his people. How is he here? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've given your life to him, his spirit is in you, is in me. Jesus' life-giving power is in us. So whatever it is that smells like death around us, Jesus can resurrect it. And it's possible this morning that somebody here might be what stinks. Somebody's thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm too far gone. I've made so many bad choices. I'm too far gone. And I'm here to encourage you and say, you're not. Jesus and Jesus alone is what brings dead things back to life. Now, where does his power come from? It comes from his intimate connection to God the Father. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the God who came to us. He's the only person who has ever been perfect, holy, loving, and good. And what did he do with all that? He used his perfect, holy, loving, and goodness. And he laid down his life for us. That's what the cross is about. And he died so we could live. Then he resurrected that's the evidence. That's the proof. That is what changed so many minds in his day. And our connection to him is our faith in him. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the life. We're never going to have to recalculate that. We will have to recalculate our belief in him. How do you stay on track? You talk to him regularly we call it prayer our father in heaven we did a study on that recently and that first word is what it stood out to me our father when I'm praying it's not just for me it's for us our father talking to him regularly I wake up nowadays because I've gone through some anxiousness through this period of making a life change and I wake up every single day, almost every single day. And I have these words pop into my head. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. And I switch right after that. I go, this is what he has done. And everything I can think of from scripture, I just start to lay it out. And I wake up and I'm not anxious anymore. 
and now I'm confident that he's in control again. There is death everywhere around us. The only way to beat death is life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So who am I? What can I do? Honestly, we all need to ask that question. Just give you a second about myself. Personality-wise, I'm on the quiet side. I lean a little bit shy. And my dad's in the back going, a little bit? Yeah, I've improved some. But with Jesus, with God, none of that gets me off the hook. Just because I lean quiet and I lean shy, God still wants to use me. He wants me to help bring life, to bring Jesus to the world. I'm an observer. I, I try to notice things. I, I notice people. So when I can get the focus off of me, he starts to reveal how I can serve, how I can meet needs, how I can lift people up. Doesn't matter if I'm quiet. Doesn't matter if I'm shy. I look at characters in the Bible and I see me all over the place. Moses being called by God. Moses is going, God, I can't talk well. I stutter. I, I, this is hard. God says, that's okay. I got it. Gideon was in hiding. Angel shows up, calls him a mighty warrior. Guess what? Gideon grew into that. David made all kinds of giant sin mistakes. Oh, I can relate. David ends up being called a man after God's own heart. That's what I want. Most of Jesus' disciples were just humble, hardworking men. They fell out of rabbinical school. They didn't make it. So Jesus called this very ordinary, regular crew, and guess what he did with them? He changed the entire world. I want to be a part of that. I think he wants us all to be a part of that. So I hope you just got a little clearer picture of who Jesus is today. Put your faith in him. Put your trust in him. Watch your hope grow and follow the one who calls himself the resurrection and the life. If you stand, we're going to pray. Our Father, God, make Jesus even more clear to us. Help us to understand it's not about us, he could reach us at any point wherever we are. He wants to reach us. Help us to grow in our understanding of him and what he's calling us to do personally, individually, corporately as a church. God, we thank you for Jesus. I, I know I'm nothing without him. <laughs>